Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Neil Gompa. I'm a contributor in Fedora Project as well as in OpenSUSE and whatnot. And here I'm to talk about like DNF versus Zipper, you know, fight, because, you know, why not? Um, so a little bit about who I am. I'm sort of a self-styled open source advocate. I'm a contributor and package maintainer in Fedora, Magia, and OpenSUSE. Uh, and I've contributed to RPM, DNF, Zipper, Kiwi, uh, the Open Build Service, and a number of the system management-based stuff. Um, for my day job, I'm a DevOps engineer um, at Datto, a disaster recovery backup business continuity company. And part of my role involves managing the release engineering of our software, including running an OBS instance internally, and doing terrible package backport things because, you know, that's what always happens when you're in a corporate environment. So let's kind of start with introducing the two package managers. Um, so to begin with, like, the one that most of y'all probably aren't too familiar with. Um, if the slide would move. There we go. Um, DNF. So it's the successor to the Yellow Dog Updater modified, or YUM, as a lot of people may uh, vaguely know of from the Red Hat ecosystem. Um, it was forked from YUM about five, six years ago to rework the internals to use the libsolve library and to offer a saner, um, maintainable API. It offers a defined plugin architecture for extending the package manager functionality. It is the package manager in Fedora, OpenMandriva, Yocto, and now Red Hat Enterprise Linux as of RHEL 8. Um, it is available also as a, as a supported package manager in Magia. It is included in OpenSUSE as of Leap 15.0, and it actually was included in RHEL 7 as of RHEL 7.6 as an option for you to use instead of crappy old yum. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, the classical zipper thing. You guys all kind of know this. It's the package manager that made a whole new class of package managers in itself with SAT solving at a large scale. It replaced the motley of crazy-ass package management options that we all inherited from Zimian and Sousa back when the two companies uh, kind of came together when Novell bought them both. Um, spawned the development of the LibSat solver, which became LibSolve. It is used primarily today in, of course, the Sousa distributions as well as Tizen. Um, and it is also in Fedora since Fedora 26, courtesy of yours truly. Uh, so it is kind of functional. Uh, all the way through Fedora 28. After that, not so much. Um, so some of the similarities here, I mean, because there are, of course, similarities between the two. So they both use libsolve for dependency resolution. The low-level aspects of both package managers are in C and C++. Plugins are supported in the base library interfaces, and they both work with package kit. So like anything that's leveraging package kit on these distributions that use the DNF or zipper, will be able to leverage those backends correctly. They exclusively handle uh, RPM metadata repositories. This technically wasn't true in the past because Zipper used to handle YAST repos, but it doesn't anymore. It silently says, well, YAST repos don't exist. We're going to do RPM repos instead. Um, and both of them actually do support fairly well being able to build custom front-end interfaces. And of course, arbitrary subcommands through extending through um, either uh, modules, Python modules, in the, or C++ programs, or whatnot. The user experience between the two is actually fairly similar as well. Um, the CLI interface structure is the same. It's, you know, the tool with the action, with the arguments for the action. Subcommands in both DNF and Zipper have standard abbreviated forms. This is something that maybe some people aren't familiar with, that in the DNF package manager, they've kind of adopted the same uh, technique that the zipper people have, where common subcommands have a short form that's easier to type and remember, so that you don't necessarily require bash completion to be able to get to them. And of course, the CLI supports colors when the terminal supports it, and will help you distinguish stuff when the colors are activated. There's graphical front ends to offer more intuitive, user-friendly ways to do software management as well, of course. Um, but there's a fair bit of differences, too. Um, the, the underlying differences between DNF and zip stack are actually quite significant. Um, the biggest one is that 
the underlying architecture for the DNF stack is very, very modular. It is split up across five or six libraries, um, if we exclude librpm itself and libsolve, uh, whereas the zip stack is one library when you exclude all of that, when you exclude those. Um, one thing that's a little bit scary and surprising is that Zipper actually installs packages by subprocessing out to the RPM command. Where, uh, with, from what I understand, from eons gone by, they couldn't trust librpm to do the right thing, so they subprocessed it and did scary things to make sure everything looked like it worked. Um, DNF, however, has no such compunction and uses librpm to install things directly. So the transaction is handled directly by RPM through the library interface and doesn't look quite as terrifying from uh, the 10,000 feet view. Um, the way that uh, you install collections of packages is slightly different between DNF and Zipper because of the comps stuff, composition groups, and now new module metadata stuff. So Fedora has this new modularity thing, which has a new extra metadata format with more stuff, and it's kind of complicated, but uh, it, it adds more things to how DNF can handle collections of packages, um, whereas, of course, Zipper has the patterns, which you all are familiar, are basically very fancy meta packages with extra properties attached to them so that Zipper knows how to find them. Um, one of the things that was actually kind of surprising when I first started looking at the, comparing the two stacks years, years ago when I was first looking at this was that uh, language bindings in Zipper are actually in a pretty poor state. Um, the zip bindings thing is not in good shape and is essentially unsupported um, and don't work. Uh, whereas in the DF stack, as a consequence of how the front end front ends are implemented and some of the hit legacy language bindings in the libraries are actually a first class citizen and they're, and while it only currently supports Python, more languages are expected to follow in the near future. Um, and DNF also has uh, an implementation that exports the uh, API as a dbus interface for applications to interrogate and manipulate um, through that manner if they wish. Um, that's something that, uh, as far as I'm aware, only the uh, yum, DNF, and apt actually have some form of this. Not very many package managers have like a direct way to be interrogated via dbus. The user experience is actually somewhat different as well, but not too much so. Um, DNF has the feature of aliases, which it inherits from yum. So you can have subcommands that you can define that are built on standard commands with options and things like that so you can make short forms of custom short forms of whatever you want. Um, another thing that DNF does that is different from Zipper is that you can actually install any package based on any file path that is in that is known by the repository because DNF actually parses the file lists uh, completely and handles that in its solver pool whereas Zipper does not normally do that. And there's multiple native graphical front ends. Um, Zipper has, to its credit, it has, strangely enough, a machine-readable output form, XML, for its output so that it can be manipulated from other tools through shell script and awk and Perl and stuff like that. One really neat thing that it does is that it can split transactions up into smaller chunks if it detects a low disk situation or if there's a special solver situation that requires splitting the transaction up. That is really handy when you're working with laptops and with small SSDs or netbooks and things like that. And that's a really nice fancy feature to have. Um, unfortunately, Yast is the only graphical front end that exists for it. Yast is cool and all, but the fact that there isn't an independent front end that kind of just works on its own makes it a little difficult to demonstrate whether how, how well to use the, the libzip API for building such things. So, yeah. As far as the ecosystem goes, like we can kind of start with the development activity of the actual package manager software itself as soon as that shows up. There we go. So for DNF, the first, the, for DNF and Zipper, the two ones at the top are actually the command line front end. So 
you can see that the DNF one starts in 2002. That's because it was forked from Yum. So if you ignore everything before 2012, that's all. 2012 and earlier is all Yum code. Forward on that is DNF. And in Zipper, you can also see that by comparison, there isn't a whole lot going on in the CLI land. Um, that's because unlike in DNF, Zipper's stack, the CLI doesn't actually have a whole lot of logic in it. Most of it is in the library. And so you can see comparatively libzip has a lot more code going on in there. Uh, whereas on the DNF side, it's a little bit mixed. There's a lot of business logic in both the CLI front end as well as in the libraries. And that's something hopefully that will be uh, fixed over time. Um, in terms of like how the ecosystem tends to use this, the plugins and extensions model is something that is very well supported in DNF. And it's something that I think actually has been a really good boost to how that, eco how that has been used by a lot of people. Because the API is now stabilized and well-defined, there's been a lot of uh, plugins and extensions for supporting interesting workflows and tools and things like that. Um, there's like over 25 officially supported plugins. Um, off the top of my head, I know of at least a dozen more that people have written that they're using. And then there's also things like Salt and Ansible, which poke the DNF API directly because they can and they know that that stuff is going to work. Uh, and that allows them to do um, more creative things when they need to. For Zipper, I, uh, I'm actually not too certain if there were that many plugins that were written for it. I could only really find a few major ones, like the, the one for Spacewalk, Sousa Manager, and the Sousa Customer Center package search plugin. That was, those were the only ones I could really find. I couldn't really find too many others. Um, the methods to support plugins and extensions doesn't seem to be that well documented or pointed out anywhere. Um, I was a little curious because, like, uh, from what I could tell, it is supposed to be capable of it. It's just not used, which I'm a little weirded out about. Um, but another bit, like, as I mentioned earlier, there was, there's also graphical front ends for the DNF stack, multiples of them. And of course, is because the CLI is scary. It's, ooh. But aside from the package kit front ends, like GNOME Software and Plasma Discover, there's a few native front ends that exist for it. Um, the first was actually Yumix DNF, which was the Yumix Tender DNF flavor. Uh, that project is now defunct, and it's been superseded by DNF Dragora, which is from the Magia project. Uh, and simple DNF, which is made by some independent developer who, who wanted to make a much simpler uh, GTK-based front end. It actually, I think, is brand new. I only found it like a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> and so I'm going to show you just a little bit of that stuff with the DNF things. So let's see here. Oh, come on. Don't do this to me now. Fine. Let me uh, kill this. And then let's go over here. Let's start this. There we go. So here I preloaded a transaction here to show. Uh, so let's make this a little, whoa, that is not what I wanted. So if you see, whoa, what is? Oh, I see what's going on here. So, 
So if you see over here, uh, this is, uh, I'm about to execute a transaction to like actually do the equivalent of zippered up on a tumbleweed system. I actually already pre-downloaded the whole transaction because, uh, well, it took like seven hours in my hotel room to download everything. So I figured I didn't want to trust, you know, Wi-Fi to work or something like that. So I should also like kill the test transaction part. Let's see. Uh, so I'm also using a short form here, desync. I could actually, if I wanted to be super clever, we'll just use dup. So do you have dup? So that shows all the stuff that's going to happen. It's going to install 160 packages, upgrade 1.5K of them, remove and downgrade a few, do a thing. Already downloaded all of it, so it's going to run a transaction check and actually do the thing. And then, meanwhile, And then over here, I have uh, DNF Dragora um, set up to install some things. I've checked a few packages and then build transaction failure. This is why you don't do demos. Let's see here. DNF Dragora. Screw it. There we go. Now it shows all the stuff. And so this is, you know, it, it, it's basically the same kind of output you'd see from the CLI, or if you're familiar with YAST, you'll see something like this when it's about to uh, propose a transaction to you. And it's just going to make me type in my password again. And now it's going to download, hey, wow, the Wi-Fi works here. Uh, so it's downloading packages and it's going to do stuff while that's happening. And then over here, you can see it's doing basically the same thing. It's upgrading the packages, running through the scriptlets and stuff. Actually, something that I learned while I was doing this, we run a lot of scriptlets during an upgrade in OpenSUSE, like a lot. Um, far more than I actually expected to. Um, but it was an interesting exercise because uh, it showed that, for one, OpenSUSE does do stuff the right way because even swapping from zipper to DNF, things work fairly well. Um, you can see all the output. It does all the right ordering and installation and stuff. There's nothing too special or crazy. Uh, actually, this virtual machine has been upgraded like three times using DNF rather than zipper, and nothing has exploded so far. So we'll just uh, go back to this. Beach ball of doom. All right, so since that kind of shows like what, what was going on in there, um, the kind of conclusions I came from this was um, the DNF package manager and the, and the zipper package manager are actually fairly comparable at this point. Um, in terms of user experience, performance, and usability, they're pretty, they're pretty up there. Uh, they're pretty good with each other, and they're pretty good as, as package managers as a whole. Um, I'm a little bit disappointed at like some of the, when I looked at how the sausage was made for a zipper, like how some of the stuff actually worked inside um, compared to, maybe it's again part of the fact that zipper is so much older and they trusted the underlying stack a lot less, but it's a little bit weird, the kind of hacks that are in there that I feel like somebody should take a second look at and maybe think maybe they're no longer needed to work this way. Um, another thing that was a sort of a thing was it feels like somebody needs to care about developing a little community around it. Uh, Zipper is a perfectly serviceable package manager and it's totally a good replacement for a lot of subpar package managers in the RPM ecosystem. 
but it seems like there's not much attempt to really drive adoption or usage of that. Um, supporting plugins and extensions is hard, and zip is, well, fill in your own word, but I would say zip is pretty awesome. Um, for the DNF side, the architecture is kind of complicated. It's a little hard to follow how all the pieces fit together. Um, on the flip side, I think the community is pretty strong. That's maybe partly my fault, but uh, the, uh, there's, there's a large number of people that are actually using it and building tools around it and doing things like that. Um, the language binding support beyond Python is still missing, and I think it kind of comes away that DNF makes Yum really not suck, not suck. It has a good CLI interface. The performance is pretty good. The extensibility is, is awesome, and generally I enjoy uh, it, man, it. Like, you shouldn't have to say, like, I, it's not that I don't want to say, I love working with my packages all the time, but, like, it doesn't make it a chore to deal with all of them. So, um, in summary, I guess, Zipper is probably still slightly up there, higher than what DNF is, but I think there, there's, there's potential in both ways, and there's still a bunch to learn from both of them. Like, DNF does, does certain things a little bit better than I think Zipper does, and vice versa, um, as I've kind of mentioned earlier. So, yeah. Uh, questions? So the question was, is there, um, to, to simplify this, the, is the question was, uh, is there an RPM-based package manager that does source to binary reproducibility bef uh, for verification before installation? Um, the answer to this is no. Uh, one, that is extremely expensive. That requires setting up build routes or worse, installing all the build dependencies on the computer first before installing the, before building it and then installing the real package at the end and then probably figuring out a way to track all the build dependencies to remove afterwards because you don't need them. Uh, and two, it's not strictly necessary most of the time. Most people who are building RPMs are hopefully using a build system that's worth a damn, like o uh, OBS or Koji, which provides source to binary guarantees and reproducibility that lets you uh, make sure you are not doing dumb things uh, in your packages. And Usually the repository of metadata can be verified to ensure it's not tampered with, either through checksums, meta links, GPG checks, or a combination of those. And with that, you can usually trace from there to the binary package, check the checksum and the signatures of those, and then install there. So you have enough paths, paths of verification that it's usually not necessary to go down the extra mile of rebuild and then install to verify the, the, the reproducibility there. Usually that's the kind of stuff you'd want to do server-side in a build farm, like in an OBS or a Koji setup. Um, but there are bits and pieces of that functionality in both package managers. Uh, Zipper has a function called source install, which allows you to uh, download, a, download or point it to a source RPM, and that will go and read it and install all the build dependencies and unpack it into an RPM build directory or whatnot so that you could just go ahead and build the package yourself if you'd like. DNF has the build dep uh, subcommand, which allows it to read a spec file or a source package and install all the build dependencies, and then you could do whatever you want there, but it doesn't have an equivalent to the source install uh, functionality. Might get it someday, but right now it doesn't have it. Um, but that's kind of the closest you get. Other package managers like URPMI, user RPM from Mandriva, they have the ability to download and unpack just like Zipper does. Um, apt RPM doesn't have any of this functionality. It doesn't, it really tries to ignore the fact that source packages exist. Um, and uh, pull deck and others are just kind of waffly on what to do with, with this kind of thing. So it's, it's not really a thing that uh, a lot of the RPM package managers concern themselves too much with. Hmm. Yeah?
You mean group installation? Meaning, you mean group installation as in like installing from one thing, from using one command to a bunch of computers at once? Or do you mean installing a bunch of packages? The latter. Okay. So, group installation in terms of installing a bunch of packages. Um, in, in the DNF stack, you have this through the composition groups or comps groups, as a lot of people call it. Um, and now with the module MD. So the module metadata and the comps groups, what they are essentially are metadata files that describe a, a set of packages that belong for a specific role or type or a, some logical grouping of some kind that a user may want to act upon. So they want to install it or remove it or upgrade them together or something like that. Um, Zipper has this kind of the similar behavior with patterns. Um, it treats the meta packages slightly differently in pattern mode and tries to accomplish the same behavior. Uh, and the reason it, it used to be that patterns were special metadata like comps groups were, like comps groups are, sorry. Um, but nowadays it is just meta packages with fancy labels and stuff inside. Um, but essentially both package managers provide that kind of functionality. For zipper, it's zipper install dash t pattern name of pattern. Um, and for DNF, it's DNF install at sign name of group or name of module, and it will go ahead and do the thing to install a collection of packages together. And it tracks those collections as they're installed, uninstalled, upgraded, and whatnot. So you will know that whether a package was installed as part of a group or if it was installed individually. Yeah? So, good question. Does, the question was, does DNF have any special behavior for handling when a user explicitly removes a sub-dependency or a weak dependency, weak installed package? The answer to this question, unfortunately right now, is no. However, because DNF tracks, how, DNF tracks the reason in which a package is installed and actually already has the information to make these kinds of decisions, the only reason right now it doesn't do things like automatically excluding a weak installed package that a user has explicitly removed is because the, the, no one has written the logic to do that. Like, it's, the, all the pieces are there, it's just the filter is not actually wired up yet. Um, there was actually an effort a couple of years ago to redo how DNF stores its reason information. They now call it a software database. It used to be a descendant of the YUM database. It's essentially a database that tracks all the transactions that have ever happened and also indicates like how the packages were installed and why. And that information also tracks when users decide to say, I don't want this anymore, and you uninstall it, it, it records that reason as well. That those reasons are currently not fully factored into the dependency solving, but they, ver they could be. And if they were, then you could get more intelligent uh, results out of that. Uh, hello. At the back here. Hello. Hi. Ah. Um, you talked about um, DNF's uh, module um, functions. Does it support any higher level functions, for example? Um, dependencies between modules or comps, or f for example, registering enterprise modules? Yeah, so unfortunately it does. So modules, modules actually export the same level of uh, interfaces and manipulation APIs that packages do. So you can install, remove, update, query them, and modules can have module level dependencies. Uh, the way that the module stuff works is it's kind of a layer. You start with a repository layer at the bottom, which has a soup of packages. Then you have module MDs that say these, these buckets in the, of these soups of packages belong with these. And then the, the buckets of packages inside are handled. So each layer, it goes all the way down. And DNF basically handles each of those as if they are like a package and you can do actions and things like that. Okay, so those are resolved using libsolve then? Libsolve knows nothing. Okay, nothing. nothing. Unfortunately, Libsolve knows nothing right now. Uh, part of this is because a lot of the behaviors related specifically to modules are not fully fleshed out to the point that we can start figuring out how they should work in Libsolve. Because it'd be unfair to everybody if we implemented it once, and then it turned out like six months later we have to change everything again. We kind of want to have a solid idea of how it's supposed to uh, behave uh, across the board before we want to do something like that and make Libsolve actually fully aware of them. 
for now, from Libsol's point of view, it looks like DNF is saying, I want to disable all these packages, or I want to enable all these packages. These are in these filter groups. These are considered higher priority, but it doesn't know why from the Libsol point of view. And can you do anything uh, like uh, enterprise registrations of RHEL using DNF for a plugin? Uh, yeah, I mean, the subscription management, sorry. The subscription management functionality has been integrated into, uh, into the lower levels. Uh, so, for example, Red Hat subscription management actually now has a C library, librhsm, which is plugged into the libdnf library as a plugin. And so if you are on a RHEL system, that plugin is built in and it will, it will track your entitlement status and regenerate the Red Hat.repo file that is installed on there to include your repositories that you are entitled to. Um, the subscription manager tool from Candlepin is the one that, uh, that manipulates the settings for that, and that's a Python program that lives a little bit outside of it, but it also wires into the DNF front end through its Python API to make sure that those things are all coherent. Um, there should be, this should be done slightly more smoothly, but uh, that takes a little bit of work of like figuring out how the uh, interactions between the package manager and the entitlement management system need to be rationalized, especially in the, in, in the, the part about handling a transition from talking to RHSM directly and talking to, and switching over to a satellite system or a SUMA system or something like that. Any other questions? Okay.